This is the story of a girl child considered to be so cursed that there is no birth certificate, no baptism record, in fact nothing that would give testament to her very existence has ever been found. The absence of record led to numerous tales about her early years being invented. In some, she was abandoned in the jungle or the desert, depending on the version being told, and left to die on the day of her birth, only to be rescued by a variety of unlikely means. In others, she was sold by her parents to a showman, and in yet more, her mother protected her from their tribe, fleeing with her to live alone in a cave until they were discovered by Mexican herdsmen. In the absence of a recorded history, anything can be told as truth. And in the case of Julia Pastrana, the tales were many. Often interwoven and embroidered to the point that her survival at all was near miraculous. And indeed it was. The year and place of her birth is accepted as 1834, in the Sierra Madre region of Mexico. The daughter of mixed parentage, part Spanish and part Aboriginal native, although some believed part of her racial heritage was African as well. Were it not for two congenital features, we would know nothing of her existence today. Now, Consider a child born covered with a thick pelt of black hair, like that of a chimpanzee, covering even her face. A face deformed by gums and teeth so overgrown and uneven that she appeared to have twice the teeth as any other human, and very large expressive eyes. That is a child destined to either great abuse or great renown. As it happens, Julia was destined for both. Her condition is known as hypertrichosis, which simply means excessive hair growth, and she was covered everywhere with the exception of her palms and soles, lips and eyes. The beginnings of her actual history have her being adopted from an orphanage by a man named Senor Sanchez, governor of Sinaloa, a Mexican state. He was later titled as Prince when her story was told on the stages of the world and he was credited with having her taught to sing and dance with some skill, and converse with a bright and engaging personality, and the manners of the upper social class. Girls born into society were given this kind of education, and as his adopted daughter, it is very likely he did see to her proper upbringing. Julia spoke and read in three languages, Spanish, English and Latin, and much care was taken to emphasize her feminine attributes. She did not learn to write, a manly endeavor, but she learned to sew and embroider and to cook, which she was said to love doing. Julia was a petite four and a half feet tall, weighing 112 pounds with a tiny waist, and was apparently employed by her adoptive father as a maid in his household. She was much mocked and ridiculed, called an ape and a he-she, among other things. She was also subjected to men lifting her skirts and feeling her breasts, pouring at her as if she were an animal. No doubt her virginity was taken during this stage of her life. 
What we do know is that her life experience has mirrored the kind of otherness with which she was born. No matter how sweetly she sang, or how gracefully she danced, how astute her mind or witty her speech, she would always bear the indelible imprint of the beast. In the year 1854, she met the second man who would change her life. He was a showman by the name of Mr. J. W. Beach, who invited her to leave behind this life of drudgery and abuse, and become an entertainer on the stage. He would manage her, and she would earn her own money. People would pay to see her perform. She would become famous, and he would protect her from abuse. Julia left the home of Signor Sanchez in the April of that year, and went to the United States with this man, and learned the ways of a travelling entertainer. We know she performed at the Gothic Hall, a musical theatre on Broadway in New York, in December of 1854, under the billing of The Marvellous Hybrid, or The Bear Woman. It was during this nine-month period that she was seen by another showman, Mr. Theodore Lent, who quietly courted her, as a gentleman courts a lady. He sent her flowers and trinkets, waited for her at the stage door, and complimented her. Little was known of Mr. Lent before his relationship with Julia, but from what can be found, it would appear that he was a bit of a wheeler-dealer, always having one eye out for the advantage. He was known to do auctions, some shady business deals, had connections to gambling and prostitution, and he knew and managed acts for theatres and fairs. Whatever else he may have been, he was clearly an astute judge of character and he saw in Julia a great deal more potential than was currently being realized. He wanted her for himself, and he knew that love was the key to this woman's heart. He took his time wooing her with sincere compliments. He showed no trace of disgust at her appearance, and he engaged her in real conversations. He walked out with her in the daytime. She wore heavy veiling to avoid attracting attention. He gazed into her eyes, and he professed his undying love for her, and he heard her say her feelings were the same. She had turned down two other suitors, but she fell in love with dear Theodore. The couple secretly eloped and were wed in Baltimore in 1855. She let Mr. Beach go as her manager and gave that responsibility to her new husband. Mr. Lent proved himself a much more capable manager for Julia. He arranged for her to be examined by respected doctors and scientists, and included their evaluations in her advertisements to attract larger and wealthier audiences. Many of their examinations were invasive and insensitive, but Mr. Lent would be holding her hand and encouraging her. She submitted herself to these examinations in large part because she wanted to know more about herself. One eminent doctor certified that she was the result of a human mating with an orangutan. Another declared her to be a distinct species hitherto unseen or catalogued. And a couple of observant anatomists stated that she was human and of Indian descent. Their opinions, of course, never made it into the advertisements for her appearances, but the first two did.
She had many different names under which she was billed when doing sideshows and freak shows, most linking her with some animal or another. What really set her apart from so many other professional freaks was that her act always focused on her human skills and talents. In most other acts, the managers would have the performer go wild and growl or howl, shaking bars of a cage, or even breaking loose momentarily. Then, in contrast, you have the bear or ape woman. Sing, dance, recite poetry in three languages, ending with a dainty curtsy while appearing more animal than the wolf man to the casual observer. Many thought that Theodore only married her to ensure that she would never leave him or be lured away by some enterprising opportunist. But Julia would say, He loves me for my own sake. And it is possible that he did, but he also certainly knew her value as a performer. He exerted a fair bit of control with regard to her social interactions. And when she would meet other showmen, she remained heavily veiled until her husband joined them. With Mr. Lent as her manager and husband, she became very famous and there was demand for her in Europe as well as North America. And this type of performer were popular among the royal courts of Europe. Those invitations further enhanced the reputation of the recipients. Because Julia used her humanity and polished manners in contrast to her bestial appearance, the reverse of most hybrid acts, she was able to come off the stage and interact with her audience without risking the carefully crafted facade. She would mingle with nobility and answer questions that were put to her by those who watched her performance. She travelled Europe extensively to packed audiences and remained distinctly unique among human oddities. While touring with the circus across Germany to Warsaw and reaching Moscow late in the year 1859, she stayed longer to give birth to a son in March of 1860. Her son inherited both of Julia's congenital conditions and he died of asphyxiation at two days old. Sadly, Julia herself died three days later from complications because of the difficult birth. Her last words are said to have been I die happy, knowing I have been loved for myself. As if to belie her final words, Mr. Lent sold the bodies of Julia and their son to an anatomy professor named Andrei Sukolov for £500, who then embalmed both of the bodies so that they would not decay. The procedure apparently took six months. The professor then began to display mother and son for a small charge and was making a lot of money, at which point Mr. Lent determined that he wanted the bodies returned to him as next of kin he was given control of the bodies. He offered the Moscow University, where they were on display, £800 in recompense for the embalming, and went back to London in 1862 with both bodies, and had them displayed together in a glass cabinet at the Burlington Gallery, 191 Piccadilly. This gallery was known for its displays of fine art, and having displayed the bodies of his wife and son there first, gave a certain prestige to the exhibit, which he continued to display for money for the next six years.
whilst on tour with his embalmed family, Lent met another woman who had the same condition as Julia. He lost no time in courting her, much as he had Julia, and the two were soon married. He changed his new wife's name to Zenora Pastrana, telling the world she was Julia's sister, and exhibiting her with Julia and her son for some years. Eventually, he put Julia in storage with her son and exhibited Zenora as Julia. After Zenora herself passed away, he continued to show her preserved corpse, much as he had Julia. The corpses ended up in Norway and were stolen in 1976 and dumped in the garbage, until they were recovered by the police. At this point, the bodies were stored in the Oslo Museum. In 2005, a Mexican artist named Laura Anderson Barbata began a campaign with the intent of bringing the remains back to Julia's homeland of Mexico, where they could finally be given a proper burial. On February the 12th of the year 2015, she was interred with her son and given the full burial rites so long denied this remarkable woman. Well, my dear viewers, what a sad story that was. Heartbreaking, actually. Could you imagine living that life, how difficult it must have been for her to be a sensitive soul and to have that outward appearance? Unbearable to think of. By the way, that story was brought to us by Tamara James, my good friend Tamara. Told me she was going to uh, write this story up some time ago. She finally got around to doing it, and I'm very glad she uh, she did so. So thank you so much, Tamara, for contributing. That was a, a very interesting tale. Uh, maybe Tamara will tell you in the comment section how she came to know about this story. Very very interesting. Uh, the only thing difficult about these really older stories is finding images. All the images I could find for Julia, that's what's there. What you've got on the screen is all the images I could find about her. But the other principal characters, no. I couldn't find anything about them. No factual images for them. Very hard even to find filler images for this. You know, you have like a classroom. Obviously, you're not going to have a bearded kid in the classroom. So what I found is what I worked with. So, And that's why I had to actually group together the top tier patrons onto a couple of images because there wasn't really any suitable images to put their names individually hope you understand that my dear top tiers uh it looks good though i think it does look good with that sort of circus theme i think one day i'm actually going to do a, a whole historical feature on freaks of nature on traveling sideshows such as this um, it's always interested me since i was a young man but very sad lives really i don't know some of them might have enjoyed it. it might have been better than where they were living you know what i mean at least they were accepted into their own community there uh, i guess in some ways if they were if they had a good boss uh, in some ways it would have been a preferable life to being in some small town and ridiculed um still you know we have a different attitude towards uh, these people nowadays but back then that was the really the only job uh, they, they could get and i remember seeing the elephant man when I was a young, very young man, had a profound effect on me too. So I think I will do a documentary. And I remember, now this is an old memory, there used to be a traveling fairground would come to the north of England when I was preteen. And it would come every year. It was called The Hoppings. That's in Newcastle upon Tyne. And I remember every year I'd save up my pocket money and I'd go with my mates and go on the usual rides. But they always had a freaks, freaks of nature um, tent and you'd go in there was no real there was no living freaks uh, apart from people dressed in suits and stuff like that but they had these really really old specimen jars and tanks 
full of deformed creatures and babies and humans and weird, weird stuff. Obviously, these were relics from the old traveling sideshow days. And this family had kept it going. I guess that's long gone now. Anyone that goes to the Hoppins, let me know if it's still there. This was the, uh, the late 70s. I do not imagine they still have Freaks of Nature. But that I always went to visit. It was the same, the same uh, specimens each year, but I was just fascinated by it. So I'm definitely going to do an historical feature on uh, the Freaks, the Carney Freaks. So, during this recording, I was terrorized by a certain cat. She was not being my muse this day. She was absolutely a pest. Normally, she's quiet, uh, and she has her certain times when she, know, when she knows that it's dinner time. But for some reason, she got it into her head that dinner time was to be two hours earlier than normal. And when she gets that into her head, she, she doesn't let go. I had to eventually lock her out uh, of my little studio room and uh, I could hear her meowing wildly at the door. I'll show you the next uh, video sequence I caught her as I opened the door. Very, very naughty. <laughs> So, of course, one has to give in, and then after that, it's sweetness and innocence once more. Look at that face. You have to forgive it, don't you? <laughs> and then after the food, there is, of course, time for siesta, where cats have to sort of just let go of the world for once in a while, let go of the worries, and, um, and eventually they know that supper time arrives, and after supper time, it's time for babies to go to sleep. <laughs> totally spoiled absolutely spoiled my dear viewers look at it <laughs> oh my goodness we are slaves to these critters so I'm gonna I'm gonna head off um, I would love to hear if any of you guys have been to traveling sideshows carnies in America England uh, the traveling fairgrounds or whatever country you're in any unusual uh, sideshow attractions that you remember as a kid. I would love to hear uh, your memories on that. That would be very interesting for me. Uh, once again, thank you, Tamara, for, for that story. And, um, yeah, by the way, I think Sarah, who was contributing stories uh, some while ago, she was away for a while. She had some medical issues, but I believe she's coming back to contribute some more stories too, so that'll be fun. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, and... Uh, I'm going to do my best to get out another bonus video for this month. And uh, yeah, catch you next time. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.